Welcome to 500 Doors, your real estate podcast, speaking with industry experts in real estate buying, selling, planning, developing, wholesaling, investing, financing, management. If it's real estate, we're talking about it. I'm your host, Kim Hayden, an award-winning six and seven-figure real estate agent with over two decades of experience. Understanding real estate is a dream for many that we, real estate professionals, have the ability to bring that dream to reality while building better communities and being the change we want to see. All righty, welcome back to 500 Doors. And why 500 Doors? Because I believe that behind every door is an opportunity, an opportunity to serve, an opportunity to engage, an opportunity to create the community that we want. Um, and this brings me to my guest today. I'm super excited. Uh, we had a great conversation before we even started recording because this is front and center for our guests today. Franco Perez, uh, having grown up in a family with an unstable housing situation, Franco is on a mission to create affordable housing in Silicon Valley. He discovered that the Bay Area's mobile home parks offer an abundance of underused land and a great growth potential. After years of dedication to his vision, Franco has established a devoted team of like-minded individuals who believe that their positive impact equals success. So let's bring in Franco because this is a serious conversation we're having here because housing is essential. Food, shelter, medication, education. These are things that make us human, right? Welcome. How are you doing, Franco? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Kim. Really appreciate it. Well, I'm excited. Just so you know, the very first home that I had as a baby, my mom and dad, was a single wide mobile home in Kansas. No way. Yes. Wow. Yes. So, uh, and then um, first marriage was in a double wide mobile home. Okay. <laughs> that, wow, that's Kansas. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The church was in a double wide. Um, and now uh, ADUs, auxiliary dwelling units, are, are like hitting the news all across Canada. So to me, that's like a park model or a, a, a mobile home. It's the same concept, right? So yeah. I, I, I'm, we got to figure something out. Oh, there are totally. too many people living on the streets. There are too many people who can't afford a home. Every child deserves to have four safe walls, right? I, I completely agree with that. And that gave me goosebumps. You know, um, it totally resonates with kind of what you said. You know, I grew up in a in a weird poverty situation, immigrated from the Philippines, had a single mom kind of raise me. And I remember at 17 years old, my dad, my parents split. My dad left. My mom wasn't really working. And I had to quit school just to work, just to afford paying rent at the end of every single month. And I remember thinking, like, why is life like this? You know, I feel like we're good people. We work hard and we could barely make ends meet at the end of the day. And, and it's just so unfair that people have to be in this situation. And I know speaking about this today, there are people out there that are that were in the shoes that I was in currently right now that have trouble with housing. And that's that's always something that I've been passionate about. So it's, 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 it really hits a spot with what you said. You know, uh, and we do have that in common. My mother left my father when I was 15 years of age. And had we not had my grandparents' basement, five of us stomping back to my grandparents' house into their basement apartment of 700 square feet, five females. Now that's just a, I mean, Hunger Games could have taken some pointers from my sisters and I, but the reality is, is, had it not been for my grandparents, I don't know where my mother would have gone. Yeah. And because yeah. there isn't enough affordable housing solutions out there. And, you know, my mother was working two jobs. So I get it. I get it. I know. I know. I truly know that that fear of, of, yeah. of not having shelter. Oh, totally. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane. And, and, um, you know, onto that, the, uh, 
kind of like you, you were a real estate agent and I was an agent for a while just doing real estate deals. When I, when I worked full time, I ended up doing door to door, like trying to get a listing for this real estate company and that sort of thing. Um, and after I got established and I was making a decent amount of income as an agent, I really came to hate being an agent because I felt like I'm, you know, being a real estate agent meant I have to help the richest and wealthiest people I know purchase the most, you know, the best investments for them. And I, and at the same point of that, I had to turn away people that hate that weren't making enough. I'm like, and tell them like, Hey, sorry, you're not making enough. You don't have enough saved as a down payment, you know, and, you know, maybe save up more or make more later down the line and I can help you. When the truth of it is, nobody's helping them. The truth of it is they're most likely never going to be able to afford housing without the right advice or the right opportunities. And I really decided to leave doing regular real estate agent stuff and tr and tried to find something that would really create an impact for those people that were in my shoes, for those people that don't have that opportunity. And, you know, it was just deep inside of me to want to find something that way. And, and came across, you know, I actually did a lot of studies of several different asset classes. I did government work for a little while and, and saw their affordable housing options. I really didn't like it. It was like a lottery system. It was all kind of um, all mixed up. And then I came across mobile home parks and I was like, whoa, there are secretly a ton of mobile home parks throughout the country and many metro areas, and they're really misunderstood. There's all these bad myths and bad stigmas about them. And they're in areas and locations that are really prime locations, right? We have parks here that are right across from the Google campus or the Samsung campus. And right across from, you know, $2 million homes uh, that, that are of average quality. And why is it that we're not optimizing these areas? And then I also looked into the parks so the people themselves as well as like, hey, they're teachers, they're working class people. These are people that have been able to stay longer in an expensive area because of the fact that they own a mobile home in these communities, right? And it really hit a light bulb in my head to realize that, wow, this is the biggest secret to, um, to housing that people really don't understand. And there's so much to improve and there's so much to learn from this whole asset class itself. And so went full time. We started a business and really just helping people get out of renting and into owning their first mobile home. And then uh, we help people sell and transition to their first real estate transaction as well. And then after doing that for a year and a half, we started building our own uh, our first prototype, actually converting, like you mentioned, these old single wides and converting it to something that was like 1500 square feet, three bedroom, two bath and pushing the limits of how beautiful we can make these homes. And since we've done that, we've done it multiple, multiple times. And we continue to do that and create more and more quality, affordable housing for everyone out there. Right. And it's so important. There's so much different elements that I could dive into about it. But that's basically what we do and and how we came about doing that. So share with me what you think are the top three myths around mobile homes. Yeah. So I want to mention that our that our perception of mobile homes are because nobody has an excuse to go in these communities. Our perception is all through Hollywood, through Netflix, through, through Eminem and Breaking Bad. And, and, and we always perceive it's a very, very low poverty location, right? And now if you come to think about it though, there's apartments, there's really bad quality apartments. You don't want your kids running around. And then you have luxury apartments that are really beautiful. And that's the thing with mobile home parks too. There's a spectrum. And it shouldn't all be seen as a super poverty location. But the top three really is number one is these communities are very low level, uh, low poverty like locations. And it, it attracts criminals and that sort of thing. I always hear this type of um, this type of conversation around it. And the, the second is the low quality of these builds, um, the, how they're constructed 
and the quality of them. And it's, it's not, and that it's not durable. It's not safe to live in. And the third really is the financial element of it. Uh, we have a lot of myths that they depreciate in value, that it's a waste of money. It's a bad investment. Uh, however, all of these three myths are pretty much all false, right? And, and that's the thing is where everything's adapted. Everything's been improved from how it was 40 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever it is. And those are really the main three myths that that we tr we aim to debunk through our YouTube channel and showcase the beauty of how these work. So we've talked about location because a lot of mobile home parks or modular or however you want to position this because I mean we we hear park model and people are like oh park model or we hear the term ADU so the auxiliary dwelling units which are the cottages the backyard cottages you can rent which are are getting approved in major markets across North America, America. And, and the reality is, is these types of products have been used through the Scandinavian countries, have been used across Europe, right? Um, yeah. yeah, so so let's talk, I want to tackle build and then I want to go into fi it's financial because we've just talked about how the location, there's a lot of good locations. There's this mobile home park in Boise, Idaho, that is a gated community. And you go mm -hmm. in and it's because they have homeowners association, they have a homeowners association, the boulevards and the streets and the sidewalks, everything is beautifully taken care of. And what's yeah. really interesting is they have some units in there that are from like the fifties with the old architecture, right? That, but they don't look old, right? They're, mm -hmm. so this, 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 complex is beautiful so yeah. when you know so there's all these so we know location varies just like location varies on houses and apartments let's talk build walk me through a little bit on you know the materials like what is it in comparison to a stick site built house like a little starter house so you can get little starter houses now that are a half a million dollars at 800 square feet mm -hmm. what's the difference between the two yeah so if we're talking build quality and that sort of thing and and i don't want to i also want to be be uh, empathetic towards you know there's no bad quality home there's also a lot of 1970s homes with these older homes that are a perfect tool for people that that's the only thing that they can afford. Right. And if that's your, that's your home and that's the stage that you got to go through now, that might be a perfect step for you to start your ownership journey. And, and that is a perfect financial tool for you. However, in the seventies, these homes were really built for temporary housing. There was really no large um, government entity that was trying to enforce quality. So you'll find that these homes were really built to be transportable and temporary. They were metal exteriors. We have metal framing within, you have paneling, and it's really a thin, very light home. Now, people have remodeled them and, and that sort of thing and up the quality of old homes, and I've seen them be, be, become beautiful too. However, if we talk to the modern day today, you know, these homes are being built in very high level quality, high, high quality factories. So we actually um, are required to go through HUD code, which is just like a, any new construction home that's being built today. So these are being built on an assembly line. It starts with the steel I-beams. Um, some people also call these manufactured homes as well, but it starts with building the steel I-beams and then they build the subfloor uh, of high quality there, which is two by four or two by six framing underneath. And then all throughout, when it comes to the plumbing, the electrical, we have all licensed. There's what's interesting in these factories is we have several different inspection points at every different stage of this assembly line that really ensures the level of quality that these homes are being built. Uh, they also test the material of how it's being built as well. They check the fire rating, the insulation rating, and the roof, uh, the roof structure, and that sort of thing as well. So. HUD is always in these factories doing their regular inspections and they pay out third party inspectors to do it as well. So that being said, 
when you're actually in a factory setting, it's we are able to really build homes at a faster rate of more quality because we can see the process done repeatedly every time. When you compare to stick built housing, we have to, if you think about it, we have to transport all the labor, we have to transport all the material. And then there's a lot of nuances in different locations. You also have to deal with the weather, if it's raining, if it's storming, if it's windy, right? And it ends up becoming a very tedious thing. But in these factories, the quality of how they're built is truly amazing. And that's what we try to showcase in our in our videos too, of how they're built and and the efficiency of how they're built as well. Another term for these homes is the RTM, ready to move. So that's uh, a term that we use up here. And I, I think people, uh, so what what I'm seeing is, is these products can be used, these homes can be used as a singular, you know, so a smaller unit, but people are also using these to create larger homes. So, you know, family homes on an acreage, you've got an acreage out there. Why would you haul a bunch of contractors out there when you can get an RTM, a ready to move property, and you put it in? Because at the end of the day, you know, all these new builds, if you go and look at stick frame homes, there are six different floor plans. It's the same yeah. as a modular product. The the uniqueness, the individual piece of it comes from the person that moves in and paints those walls and, and puts in their own quirky furniture or, you know, adds the red teapot to the kitchen counter. That's the uniqueness of the space. Um, there's, yeah, there's go ahead. Actually things I wanted to bring up too, because you mentioned that that really is a thought that I think is very important. There's one is the waste element for the environment. We are able to save on materials as well. The, because we are consistently building in the same factory, the lumber and material, we're able to cut and, and store extra lumber to be used in another job site or another home itself. And if you think, I was just talking to a process improvement guy that uh, develops these factories but he mentioned that on a regular job site where it's stick built you usually have about three giant dumpsters that have to be thrown away for waste whereas in a factory built home a 1500 square foot home actually only has 30 percent of a dumpster of waste and that's huge we're wasting way less material and that's you know that uh, that lowers our carbon carbon footprint by so much and it lowers the amount of waste we're having and it also affects the affordability as well i mean with the affordability if we i i want to i always love to bring this up because if you think about it cars originally were only built for the rich before and aren't only affordable by the rich and wealthy before it was only until they were able to build this in an assembly line that they were able to build it at a much more affordable rate at a faster and efficient rate to keep the cost low and to allow for these cars to be accessible to everybody. And that big improvement of how we build these homes is really what's gonna make the difference of how we can continue to build quality homes at an efficient and effective rate and keep the cost of it at a very low rate as well. And, and that's exactly what's happening. This is an assembly line for these homes and it really is the future of housing. The And the waste is, um, I think it's something when we're in an environmentally conscious society, we have become conscious of what we're dumping into our dumps, where we're shipping our garbage, um, that when we're dumping, and yeah, it's, it's like here we were saying um, it is 30% less waste goes to the landfill. So imagine that off of every single unit, that means one entire house is not even hitting the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, our, our landfills and we can't afford, we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, the taxation on plastic bottles. We're wanting to get cars off of, uh, uh, off of uh, petroleum products. Like there's all these things going on and yet we have to start rethinking it. Uh, our homes. Um, I want to tackle financials because modular products don't tend to qualify for the same financing as a fixed product. Um, 
but when you go through your financials, and I know that on new homes, so on uh, first time home buyers, the one thing that always kind of goes, oh, I didn't know I needed to do that, was making sure they have factored in money for the maintenance every year, right? So you can preserve the value of the property. Do you need 4% of the property value or 10% of the property value that you're going to reinvest annually? So let's talk financials because these are true entry level home buyers. What do you do to help them help set them up for success? And how, what are the things that you have found that people can use in order to get financing on these? Because I, I'm guessing a lot of people just don't walk around with $50,000 yeah. in their pocket and decide that they want to buy, you know, a ready to move product or a modular product. Yeah. So, um, great question. The, I want to talk about the, the housing and the problem in our area, in the Bay area. Um, now awesome. I'm going to, explain, I'm going to explain these numbers. Now it's going to be way different for a lot of the listeners because the Bay area is a very expensive place. However, this, this model really works at a smaller ratio of cost in other areas like LA, San Diego, Phoenix, other Metro cities as well. But in our area, in San Jose, California, a two-bedroom rental apartment is about $3,500 a month, right? That's a very high cost of just paying rent to a, for an apartment or um, an apartment building to rent that for a family. And then the median cost to purchase a single-family home in our area is $1.6 million, right? Very high cost to just get an average single-family home. And for people that are renting at $3,500 a month, it's so it's such a far out reach to ever feel like you can ever own a piece of real estate at, at that high uh, of a purchase price at 1.6 million to get financing, to pretty much get a home accepted. You'd have to come up with like 250,000 down. You'd have to have a payment of about $8,000 a month. And it's a very heavy feat. And for a middle-class person to be able to ever do that is it's, it seems unrealistic. Now, if we look at the mobile home in a mobile home park in our area, um, an average uh, an average home of like, let's say five years old is about $350,000. Now for that home, they'll, they can get financing. It's about 25 year loan. There are current loans for that. Oh, now. Awesome. So, and awesome. then with that, you can have a 10% down payment, which is only about $35,000, which really keeps it at, at a much more affordable and attainable process, right? So their down payment would be about 35K and their space rent would be about $1,000 and their mortgage would be about $2,500, which really keeps it around that same payment, monthly payment that they were paying for rent originally, where all of that money pretty much goes away. Now your payment and your personal cash flow is actually going towards an asset that you own, right? And that's the key element here is they're, they're just sh shifting their housing uh, vehicle and their financial vehicle to a mobile home. And just by doing that, they're getting a lot of financial benefits like appreciation, uh, loan buy down, equity. These are things that really are only, I feel like, are only being beneficial to the rich and wealthy. However, with these, you're really able to attain these benefits and tax benefits as well at an entry cost, right? And with that, that becomes then the stepping stone to get you out of that huge rent cycle and owning yeah. a mobile home. And then five years down the line, we did our, a case study. If you compare a renter at that price with a mobile homeowner at that price, the, de the delta is actually $95,000, right? And then with that, just by living there and paying the same amount, you have an extra 95K that you, when you sell your mobile home, you can use that to help purchase a single family home or a townhouse later down the line. Right. And this model, I know I said really high cost numbers, but let's say the average yeah. prices are like 30 percent less in your area. That can be just equivalently done the same. And that's that's the whole concept of why this is such a beautiful thing. And and those numbers are actually the same numbers that you would see in Toronto and New York and uh, those types of areas. So, I mean, that's not that's not uh uh, those are those numbers don't shock me because Canada has some of the highest uh, uh, 
price per square foot in the world. We have some very expensive real estate. So um, I, I do want to ask, uh, you know, is there, so the reality is, is people who are buying mobile homes in uh, your market are not going to be the same. They're probably more financially savvy than somebody who's going to buy a, a mobile home, let's say in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because of the mm -hmm. price difference, right? Um, yeah. But I do want to, to, you know, talk about that a little bit more. So when you're introducing these people to home ownership, what does, what do you go through what they can expect for property maintenance and what are the different terms? Do Does your team help them with that type of almost orientation into home ownership? Yeah. So usually with our team, for example, and we, we give a lot of advice and, you know, and it's always, I'm not the type to say that one's right for or the other. However, I feel like everyone should have their own custom built advice, right? So we really go through advising like, hey, what are your current financials? What are your what are your goals? And we break down what whether or not this is feasible or whether or not this is right for you. And the ultimate thing first is just to know that this is a consideration and something that's an option for you outside of just renting or just purchasing, because in a lot of areas, you'll want to live where cl close to work or close to a good school for your kids. And we really walk them through what they're current, what they're currently paying for rent, what is their credit, how much do they have saved as a down payment, if they can't afford a mobile home just yet, what are the steps that we can help guide them to getting that as well. And we really aim to pump out as much of this educational content at scale through our YouTube channel, through speaking on your guys' show. You know, it's it's really something that I'm so passionate about is just educating people that this is an option and it should be something that should be considered and it shouldn't be ignored, right? Because unfortunately, being growing up from uh, a middle-class family, there's so much that I wish I knew when I was younger. I wish I had the education of understanding net worth, uh, understanding assets over liabilities, understanding that the huge difference between paying rent and having a home that you're paying down the loan, right? Because just that simple clarity of sometimes paying more on a mortgage can really mean a better positive for you versus paying less on rent, right? And and um, these are the decisions that we really try to gain, uh, give the correct advice for. A lot of cities are shutting mobile homes down. They're they're not. They're taking the land back. They're, they're, we're seeing some things along those lines. How can we advocate? How does somebody advocate for affordable solutions like beautiful gate? I think, honestly, some of these gated communities that I've seen, we have another one here in just outside of Calgary that is a plus 55 community. And it's mm -hmm fully gated and it's walking distance this little lake and everything and i'm going what an awesome option it's all main floor living which with an aging population what do we need right um you know it's and land is valuable so you have to get really creative as to like main floor living but if cities are against them how do we get cities to listen yeah so i was just in dc uh last week actually showcasing to Senate and, and state Congress and, and that sort of thing. And, and it's really a touchy conversation because, and I, I think it really stems down to the false perception that people have, right? And, and that's really the main thing is that people perceive because they've never been to one. I mean, even, even realtors in our area, I, I talk to real estate agents and they're like, whoa, this is a mobile home park. Wow. You know, I would or at first before even going there, like, I don't want to go in there. You know, it's dangerous or whatnot. But it's really the perception of these. The first thing is really showcasing to these municipalities, the mayors, the, the people that are, are these decision makers, show them, hey, 
let's go to this community. And that's why we pump out a lot of video tours because we can really show at scale as well how beautiful these communities are, the gated communities, the swimming pools, the amenities. That's a huge element of it. And the second huge element to it too is really showcasing the beautiful stories that come out of these homes, right? So the teachers that are, that I, I just interviewed a teacher that we helped uh, own one of these homes and, and she was so happy because she was being pushed out of this area and all of her coworkers having a low income of being a teacher are being pushed out of this area because they can't afford living here. But because they were able to purchase a mobile home, they were able to stay here and feel financially secure and have opportunity for financial freedom. These stories is really how we have to understand these mobile home parks to are. And we have to protect these parks because they're misunderstood. People have have weird fears and want to close them down because that's they perceive what they see on the media. Um, that's really that's really it, I feel. So, yeah, and that's 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 a big one. It's interesting because Warren Buffett, Clayton Holmes, Warren Buffett is very, very, I'm going to use the stock term here, but very bullish. Like he believes in mobile homes. He believes that modular products are uh, a key to the solutions of our housing crisis. And folks, we are in a housing crisis. In Canada alone, we are short. And you got to remember the population here is less than California for all of Canada. And we're short 400,000 homes. And we have we are slated over the next five years uh, an additional, what is it? I want to say, I want to say it's like, it's like half a million people immigrating to Canada. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to live? Where are they going to live? Yeah. I don't care if you're, if you're scrubbing toilets or you own the factory that makes the toilets. The reality is every human being has a right to their four walls. They really do. You have a right to the safety and security of having a safe place to lay your head at night. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have to get really creative and get a little loud, get a little yeah. loud. Let the cities know that if you're taking down. So here in Calgary, we see a lot of older neighborhoods that the schools are no longer in use. Do you see that in your in where schools are not like full anymore? Do you guys see that in any of your markets? Not in the area that I'm in currently, but I, I have heard a lot about this. So as, as we move further out of the cities for affordable housing, because our inner city becomes more and more expensive, these schools and these different infrastructure pieces are no longer needed. Yeah. They're underutilized. Why wouldn't you take the amount of space that schools are on and look at alternative housing opportunities and mm -hmm. create uh, simplified infrastructure housing like uh, mobile homes. So these are things that, you know, I, I love the fact that you came on this and I love the fact, Franco, that you are willing to tackle this. I mean, I don't think Buffett gets, you know, nobody thinks Buffett is not smart or not good with money because he's investing in mobile homes, but he, he, this is like a big piece of his portfolio mm -hmm. is in the mobile home or the manufacturing or the ownership of the actual communities yeah. all across the United States. So, and, and, yeah. Oh, sorry. And you talked a lot about kind of the problem and, and the sad truth is that it's this problem of affordable housing. It's getting worse and worse. I, I think what, what sometimes is the issue. We have a lot of bad news and sort of thing, and we don't have enough, like you said, attention. We're not loud enough. This problem is just, it's its getting bigger and bigger at a slow enough rate so that people aren't pissed off and realize, right? And and it's going to continue to get worse. Our af The affordability of these homes aren't going to get better. The material costs are getting more expensive. And also a huge part of our skilled labor, the, 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 con the construction workers working at these sites are 50 and over and they're retiring and we're getting less mm -hmm. and less of them. And we don't have younger generation people that are excited about working with a hammer and and doing construction so 
we have to realize how big of a problem this is and we have to disrupt and we have to innovate and we have to build so much, you know, we have to build so much better. And, and because it's not a, a huge pain point yet for anyone, it's becoming this slow, slow switch where this wealth gap is getting spread wider and wider. And, and it's so sad for me because I, I've came from there before and, and I want to keep this equal opportunity for everybody. Right. And, and that's how I feel it I mean, should be. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. It's, it's, it's what wakes me up every morning. So, well, and that's what America, come on, folks, let's go back to this. The American dream is a home. It's mom pie and the uh, mom and apple pie. It's not, it's not uh, having your own jet. It's not having five McMansions spread across the country. It is the fact that in the United States, the, 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 what the United States was built on and, and also Canada is that. It's a country you can come to or a country that you're born into and you don't have to stay within a negative set of standards, right? You don't have to stay impoverished. You can go to school. You can get, you know, an opportunity to own your own home, to have those four walls, to create security, to create legacy for your children. And that's what we really need to, to, come back to great awesome you you've made a ton of money uh you've built a big giant house but don't don't block don't block somebody else starting on their path maybe find solutions right um i i just really i wish we could get back to some core fundamentals i mean i and please if you hear this and the kardashians hear this uh, I, I'm not poo-pooing the car, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting anything out there to get sued on, but the reality is that's not reality. Mm -hmm. You know, that is not reality. Reality is people are paying more and more and more because there's less and less and less right now in Calgary, in our real estate market, it is literally five or six or seven buyers that are presenting offers for that starter product. And a starter product, the starter home is now rocking that 600,000 mark. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't, we can't continue to go this route because that's not starter. That's not a starter income. That's, I mean, that's not starter folks. We need places for people to be able to launch. And uh, I really love what you're doing. I really do. I appreciate that. Can you give us, share with us um, the legacy you, if I were to spin this ahead, you are 45 years old. And just so you guys know, he, he is actually older than he looks. So, but let's, let's spin this ahead 15 years. What's the legacy you would like to leave? I, I, I'd say a model that really, that really, I like to inspire people to not, um, let me start over. I really want to inspire people to start businesses that are really there, not just to chase profits and money and that sort of thing, but to really pursue creating an impact and making a difference. I, I think we forget that sometimes through watching YouTube shows or that sort of thing. It's like, how do we make more and every month and that sort of thing. Whereas I love supporting businesses that are really that really have a drive and a mission to build something that can create an impact more than the dollars and cents that come out of it um but i'd say 15 years from now i'd love to to see mobile homes really seen as the perfect or a, a huge option for people of low income to have as a, their starter home to have as a stepping stone to get out of that rent cycle and to start their home ownership journey. You know, I just like with what you said, I, I want to be loud about this because whether it's through our company or not, you should know that this is an option out there. And this is something that can really help you start generational wealth, start financial security for your family. And to me, knowing that I can create an impact for one person already 
creates joy for myself and fulfillment for myself. But to know that our team can do that at scale and to know that the educational pieces we put out there does it at scale, it means so much to me. And I think fulfillment is the most underrated compensation um, to me. So I love that. Fulfillment's most underrated compensation. I, I love that. I love that. Did you know uh, they did a recent study on wealth and they found the happiness quotient tends to be between uh, 80,000 and 240,000. Meaning that at over 24250, there's no difference in happiness. So, you know, I'm not saying don't strive for more, but put that more to good use. Leave a legacy. Yeah leave a legacy that you're proud of. So um, I, I'd love to bring up um, where can people find you, follow you? Where's what platform is your favorite platform to engage in? You know, those yeah. types of things. So all of our links, you can find it here at this www.franco.tv that shows our Instagram channel, our YouTube videos where you can really see how these homes are built. We do factory tours that show you the inside of them and, um, yeah, all of our links are there, or you can Google us at Franco, Franco Mobile Homes is the name of the company. So, yeah, that is awesome. All right. Uh, we know that building a business, living life, anything and everything, there's hard days, right? We all need some inspiration. So I would love for you to share a quote or a saying either from your mom or from some great scholar or maybe one that you've just are the marching orders that you give your team, but what is a quote that inspires you? Oh, um, man, wish I had one prepared. There's so many, I think, uh, I'd probably just say, keep it simple. This might be cliche, but the, the Nike quote of just do it. I think we have a lot of weird fears and insecurities that we need to really just take a step in action um, and be afraid to try things and not be afraid to fail. It's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to spend months on something that doesn't end up panning out the way you want it to. You know, we have to, we have to help people understand that, that failing isn't something to be afraid of, but it's something that's required to succeed. And, and yeah, I'd say that's probably the most I, important thing. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's failure is a good thing because that's what builds. I mean, uh, if Edison had quit the first time the light bulb did not work, think about it, folks. You know, how many times, how many stabs do they have to figure out to, you know, take a, take a stab at uh, developing penicillin? A lot of stuff, ha a lot of great things happen because of failure. Right. So because something went sideline. So I, I agree. Just do it. If you want to make a change, just do it. Um, if you are listening to this and you're in a city, you're going, huh, are there mobile homes? Is there something going on? Um, you know, Franco, is there a, a an association that people can actually join, like a legislative association out there uh, protecting or encouraging or supporting mobile home owners or mobile home a lot like the the communities the the association the associate there are several the one that i like that i'm a member of um, is mhi which is manufactured housing institute um, and they do a lot for really protecting the affordability of these homes protecting these communities you know we've like you said we face a lot of um, they call it nimby not in my backyard. They try to close these parks down because they're misunderstood. Um, but they really have uh, beliefs that I align with too. So, yeah. Awesome. So folks, you know what? MHR, take a look. If you are out there in your community and if you're a real estate agent wishing there was more opportunities in your market, go out and make them. Go out and make those, make those opportunities. Get involved. That's all I can say. You, you create the community you want to live in, period, right? Right, Franco? Totally. We create. 100%. You have that. All right, folks. Until next time, I appreciate you sharing your most valuable resource, your time. And uh, be good to yourself. That's all I can say. 
be good to yourself. So let's stick around and watch my super duper outro. Thank you for joining us at the 500 Doors, your real estate podcast. Be sure to join our Facebook group at Real Estate Success with 500 Doors. Keep on watching and don't forget to like, subscribe, 